All right. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. So today, we always talk a lot about healthy lifestyle. We always you know, toss in a little bit of that entrepreneurial story. And I do love the power of, I used to say for a long time, networking. Uh, but nowadays, I actually try and hand this off to more connecting. You know, let's try and connect better with our fellow mankind, womankind, etc. Well, shout out to Nate Bailey for a little bit of a connection here because he was a past guest co-host on this show. And he decided to send us over somebody that he thought would really give back to our audience. So let me give you guys the quick skinny here. She is a functional, emphasis here, functional medicine nutritionist with her own private practice in Dallas, Texas, people, big old Texas. And uh, she helps people with a wide range of nutritional needs and enhance their athletic performance, improve their physical and mental health, and make positive lifelong health changes. I've shared some of that over the three years of this show as well, myself. And uh, she's also a fitness model and a public speaker, looking to grow that experience, just like myself. So anyway, her goal is to inspire and motivate others to take control of their physical and mental health. There's a balance here, people. And so that way they can achieve the life that they desire. So without further ado, the owner of rachelshear.com, name herself, Rachel Shear. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be on here today. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, love the studious look. She's, ladies and gentlemen, she's rocking the glasses. Oh. Who can see this on YouTube? But uh, uh, most of your photos and stuff on your website, obviously, you've done some quality professional photography work. I'll just say that. Um, I guess that comes with being a fitness model, right? Yes, for sure. I, I don't always rock the glasses and a lot of my workout attire is a fitness model. But uh, yeah, my website, they're a little bit more professional. I would yeah. Have to say. And we'll do some screen sharing during the show. But like, so when did you actually get into the fitness model component? Was that like the early part of the game? No, not necessarily. I was not born with six pack abs. I have to say a lot of people me on social media. They're like, Rachel Shear, the girl with six pack abs. And that's kind of what I branded myself as, I'll say initially, not currently, but it kind of started that way. Um, but getting into the fitness model side, I was always interested in nutrition, dietetics. I went to Baylor for nutrition and dietetics. And uh, I was always interested in eating healthy. My dad actually suffered from mental disorders as I grew, grew up and as was a young girl. And uh, I grew up actually very, very unhealthy is kind of how I like to describe it. I had very little parental supervision. I was actually neglected quite a bit as a child too. So I really had to fend for myself. So I literally lived off of like Halloween candy. Like I would store up like pillowcases and pillowcases of Halloween candy and I would have like drawers full and I would like eat that for meals. You know, sometimes my dad would take me out to get like McDonald's, you know, and things like that, which were like fun treats. But my diet as a kid was like awful. Um, I was an athlete though. I was a gymnast and I was a dancer. So I grew up as an athlete. Luckily that kept me in pretty good shape. I think when you're a kid, you can get away with eating, you know, candy and McDonald's and things like that. But because I ate almost like so unhealthy and then given my dad's um, mental issues too. I really wanted to get more into the health side of things. So when I went to college, that prompted me to want to study nutrition, dietetics, but the fitness modeling aspect came much later. Um, as I was studying nutrition and dietetics, my boyfriend at the time was into weightlifting. Hmm. And uh, I was just the stereotypical girl. I would, you know, go to the gym, I would maybe do the elliptical for a straight hour, do some basu ball crunches, and then call it a day, you know, thinking that was going to be like the key to get those six pack abs. But I started to combine the weightlifting and given my athletic background and then studying nutrition, I was like, hey, like I'm feeling better. I'm having better energy. And I was obviously really enjoying the transformation that it was having on my body. And I was like, well, maybe I'll start to compete. There was a lot of going around on social media at the time of like people in the fitness competitor industry, bodybuilders. So I started with competing, which thus led into more of the fitness modeling side of things. So I mean, now do you still do any of the fitness modeling now? Or are you focused 100% on the functional medicine and nutrition? I do fitness modeling. I no longer compete. Okay. Um, I do fitness modeling and then mainly the functional medicine side of things. Okay. 
All right. And actually, just just for, well, since we do screen sharing anyway, let's go ahead and pop it up here. Ladies and gentlemen, she hinted at the six-pack abs. So if you go to Rachel Shear with an S-C-H-E-E-R.com, we'll have it tagged in the show notes. She's not lying. Uh, the main photo right on the main page is nutrition tailored to you. And there are the abs. So, and then obviously cute puppies and some great shots of some food. <laughs> What's the name of the pup? Um, that would be Lucy and Raider. Raider's the little one? Raider is the big one. Oh, okay. The big- and then Lucy uh, obviously two different breeds, right? Because of size? Two different breeds, correct. Yeah. We have a we have an English red tech coon hound. And uh but n- now we call him uh what do we call him actually? Well he, he we named him just he's a tripod because we had to take one of his legs off to save him from cancer over Thanksgiving. And now he's just as spastic as he ever was at ten and a half years old. So you could take a leg away. You can't take his energy away. <laughs> Uh, but listen, let's, let's dig in here. Nutrition, right? I, I'm all about my, my tagline is fuel, right? Fuel your health, fuel your business, fuel your lifestyle from the podcasting perspective. Uh, I have two different feeds on Instagram, right? The live the fuel feed is more the business and the brand, but really it all does overlap. I have my personal name up there too. And yeah, I mean like last weekend I went and tackled my first attempt at an ultra race. So for people who are newer to ultra racing, I decided to do this in the mountain biking world. So I was trying to accomplish my first 101 mile mountain biking race, not on a road bike, a mountain bike. <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I've been training for the past couple of years as a, as a ketogenic athlete. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, what do you mean, you know, ketoacidosis or, or ketosis or... And, uh, and that's why I wanted to dive right in with you on that, because when you talk to legit medical professionals, they do understand the difference between keto- the state of ketosis that your body's in and mm-hmm. ketoacidosis. So just right off the bat, because that personally relates to me, do you ever casually bounce around this very hot topic nowadays from the pu- functional medicine side? Yeah. And I actually used to work for a hospital and we put even children on the ketogenic diet quite a bit because it helped a lot with uh, neurological disorders such as like epilepsy and seizures because when your brain is using uh, ketones for fuel versus glucose, it has amazing effects in terms of health, like seizures, like I said, epilepsy helps a lot of people with migraines. I definitely think it's not one size fits all and the ketogenic diet is not going to work for everybody. Um, But there are those individuals, especially those with specific health concerns that it does wonders for. Well, the biggest reason why I love it is because of the anti-inflammatory benefits of it. Mm -hmm. So, and I agree with you, obviously, like anybody looking into a massive dietary change, uh, Rachel, I think you and I can agree that everybody's timeline is going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got different biologies, different backgrounds. You just hinted at a very candy rich uh, childhood uh, I did not have that very often. I grew up I grew up on a farm. So it's funny because nowadays I literally yell at my parents and I was like, "Hey, remember how you raised us? Like go do that, dad. Like you're a type 2 diabetic now only because of your lifestyle choices. Like just eat the way you taught us as a kid. It's not rocket science." Yeah. <laughs> so I figured you would appreciate that. It's a little little sharing there. So um but to your point, like I was a farm kid, you were an athletic kid. Uh, I did. I did try getting into baseball, basketball, and I'm doing a lot of martial arts actually later on. But the gy- gymnastics, man, gymnasts are fit. I mean, legit. Like you, as a youth, go through a lot of. I like to call it like structural foundation building because if you are a strong gymnast for most of your childhood, that usually most of the time carries through the rest of your life. Oh yeah, for sure. I think. Uh... I remember as a kid, I would like climb trees too to the very tip top and my parents would be yelling at me at the neighbors. I think there was occasions where I was like on the neighbor's roofs, like doing cartwheels up there, doing my gymnastics. Like I had zero fear as a kid at all. Um, But yeah, I think gymnastics is just an awesome sport because it just sets, excuse me, it sets the foundation for really anything. And it did wonders for me. So when I wanted to get more into the bodybuilding world, um, strength training, I really had that foundation to grow from. Well, I love that you, you hinted at that earlier in the show too, right? The strength component. You, you kind of made a casual joke about how, you know, you, you went into the elliptical. Uh, and I think a lot of beginners, and, and this, there's, there's no fault here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, everybody's, uh, there's a common thing I say on this show, Rachel, nowadays, where I say, we're just all at a different place on the timeline. And, I, and I've spent years doing, you know, 
casual nutritional coaching for people. I don't try and aggressively push it because again, everybody's at a different place psychologically. People that are too close to me, I can't help them. It took me a couple of years to realize. I'm like, okay, you need to go talk to somebody else. We, we just know each other too well and you're not going to listen. Um, but the point here is that, again, you didn't know you were doing necessarily wrong, but you didn't realize what you're missing. And I love seeing people later in life realize what they've been missing. Like all of a sudden they start doing strength training, especially uh, cause I'm a big CrossFit guy too. So I'm a CFL one trainer and I see people in their sixties realize that they can lift up a barbell with no weight on it. And then a few months later, they're actually putting weight on it. And they're like, Oh my God, I feel stronger and more energized than I ever did. And to your point earlier, you mentioned you pair that with proper fueling of the body and anti-inflammatory benefits, not just from a nutritional or ketogenic way, but like right, right sleep cycles, right hydration, like all these components get married together for a proper functional alignment. So why don't you help us understand from your perspective where I'm going with all this? <laughs> yeah, and it's definitely a lifestyle approach. The way I like to describe it to a lot of my clients is kind of like a pyramid. And we all remember the old food pyramid, but you know, the bottom was like bread and carbs and then you know, towards the top was maybe like candy, but there was very little like fats in there, very little protein sources. See, it wasn't always like, that way though. There was, was a prior pyramid that was accurate. Yes. <laughs> then yes. we somehow shifted it. <laughs> yes. The food pyramid of the nineties, I would say that one yeah. going back to it, which led to a whole host of health issues. Um, but I like to describe like the food pyramid when I look at it is like the bottom is going to be your nutrition. That is going to set the foundation for everything. You cannot work a bad diet. You know, you can somewhat, but realistically, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. um, up next on the food pyramid or on the pyramid would be like exercise. We all got to do some type of exercise. You don't got to be a bodybuilder. You don't have to be a marathon runner, but you do got to be moving. You mm -hmm. got to be moving of some sort. Our body is definitely in a use it or lose it mentality. So as we age, you know, we sit on our butts all day. We begin to break down muscle tissue. So we need to be moving and keep our body active. This does more than just the physical, but for our mental health as well too. And then up next on the pyramid would be things like our hydration. It would be our sleep. It would be um, supplements that we're taking. And it really kind of goes in that order. And they all fit together for in the grand scheme of things for overall health. But going back to what you were saying before, like, what I thought what I was doing in the gym, I just thought that's what you do. I just thought you'd go in, you do the elliptical. And it just comes down to just lack of knowledge. You just don't know what you don't know. So it's very important to become educated on these things. But nowadays, there's, there's information everywhere. So it's almost a little bit confusing because everyone's now an ex expert in nutrition. Everybody eats food and everyone thinks their way is the highway and that's the only way to go. So you do have to be careful about where you're also getting a lot of your nutrition information from. That I agree with because you are correct. I mean, it's, it's amazing that we have the level of digital exposure today. It's so amazing. So it's great though for people like you and I, if we actually know what we're talking about, and all I got to do is tell somebody, okay, well then great. Here's some sources. Like I'll, I'll send you a list. If you don't believe me, here's, mm -hmm. here's some recommended proven, you know, resources that you can go and look at. And, and there's other people that I work with that, they geek out like I do. So it's like, okay, I want to get some DNA analysis done. I'm going to send some stuff in for some hormonal analysis, maybe some blood work. And I wasn't always that way. But then once you start diving down this, this, little, uh, this little hole, it's like, oh, wait, I can learn this. I can find out this. So it, and, and really podcasting ruined it for me because I, I had a geneticist on this show a couple of times, Dr. Anthony J. And he'll, he'll take your 23andMe analysis and he's like, listen, I don't care about what that stupid website tells you. He's like, he's like, you can actually go into your account and export the raw data file. And he's like, send that to me. He's like, I will do my own health supplemental and uh, chemicals analysis on your DNA data that they gave you and tell you exactly what your markers are, what are the best supplements for you, what are the chemicals that you specifically need to avoid versus maybe your wife or significant other or even your own family members? Because even though you have similar genetics, not everything carries through, uh, through, the, through the different generations. So geeky. <laughs> so I don't know, if you, have you gotten into some of that fun? Yeah, that actually goes right in correlation with functional medicine. So as a functional medicine nutritionist, I'm looking at the root cause. 
Okay. So why do we have a problem in the first place and what can we do to restore function? So with typical Western medicine, I like to call it like a Band-Aid approach. For example, someone comes in with type 2 diabetes, traditional Western medicine, we say, here's some insulin, we send them on their way. Maybe the doctor will say, you know, you need to kind of watch your weight, maybe go on a diet or something like that. But with functional medicine, I'm addressing that root cause, which for example, someone with that type 2 diabetes, it comes down to what? Their diet, their lifestyle, their lack of exercise, mm -hmm. what they're putting in their body. And that's going to have the greatest effect. So why then just put a Band-Aid over the symptoms? You know, while they're still going to have a lot of other health issues, I can guarantee with someone with type 2 diabetes, it is not just the insulin resistance that they're dealing with. They probably also have chronic inflammation, high cholesterol. A lot of times I see them struggling with blood sugar imbalances. And then they may even have things like anxiety, depression. So there's a lot more than just like that main symptom. So when we can address the root cause, we can fix more than just that small little symptom and we can have a better quality of life. And that's just the approach that I personally think that everyone should be taking should mm -hmm. be more of a functional approach, which goes back to doing a lot of different testing. So maybe we do need to do some genetic testing. I've done some things like APOE genotype testing, mm -hmm. which actually looks at how your body digests carbs versus fats in the body. So for example, if you're an APO44, you really don't want to be on a high fat diet um, because it can cause more plaque buildup in your arteries and you also have a greater risk for Alzheimer's as well too. So I can look at someone's genetics, give them some recommendations like you were saying, but I also do some testing in terms of like hormonal imbalances. I even look at the adrenals, your body's stress response, cortisol. Cortisol is a very catabolic hormone that our body makes and it breaks body tissues down. And elevated cortisol chronically can cause, again, a whole host of issues. So people who have migraines, people who have depression, anxiety, we can take more of this type of an approach to help alleviate a lot of their symptoms and get to that root cause versus just slapping a Band-Aid over the issue. Well, and I think it's also important to clarify when we throw out uh, little terms like fat and cholesterol nowadays, especially, and I can only, I can talk to this only because I, I was deep, deep, deep involved in this project and I can't wait because you and I are recording this on Friday, July 26th. <laughs> and on the 30th, we got a movie coming out and it's called Fat, a documentary by my uh, good friend and client, Vinny Tortorich of Fitness Confidential. He's one of the top podcasters out there. And uh, he brought in all the scientists. He brought in all the uh, medical researchers. And he said, listen, let's, let's get the truth out there, right? Let's, let's differentiate the sad diet, standard American diet, the, the pyramid you hinted at that we went the wrong way with in the 90s, <laughs> and help people understand like you're talking about what is a carbohydrate, how sugars are actually impacting us way more than we ever realized they would, why there is healthy fat sources out there, and helping people understand that, for example, be careful with the generalization of cholesterol. To your point, get the testing, right? Because if you don't consume healthy cholesterol, I've learned, we've learned this from all the biologists out that, and the people that are in the movie too, it's like, if you don't consume any cholesterol, your body still makes it. It's actually required at the cellular level. So helping people understand that a, a surface level cholesterol test that the average doctor may run on you is worthless uh, because all you get is the LDL and the HDL and it actually doesn't tell you enough. They actually tell you that you want to get something called a particles test. It's a deeper dive and only the legit heart doctors and, and practices even know to request that. I'm guessing at the functional level, you guys know to request that because people are like, well, why does the particle size matter? Well, to your point, this whole plaque thing, plaque is not even a big issue. Again, please correct me on this. Plaque is not as big of an issue as you think if you have a low inflammatory lifestyle. So if your vessels are not inflamed to the point where the cholesterol and the plaque sticks on it, people don't realize that, wait a minute, why is it sticking on it? I'm like, well, because your stuff's inflamed. If you have excessive sugar and carbohydrate intake and you are inflamed, then obviously those things are definitely be more of a concern. And this comes from a lot of the top heart doctors out there. So is that some of the testing you like to request as well? Yeah, so I'm actually opening a concierge practice here at the end of the year where I'm teaming up with a cardiologist that specializes more in the genomic side. Yeah. And he does that exact testing that you're talking about, which he does the particle counts. 
He does some genetic testing associated with it too. And yeah. he is really against just looking at general, you know, HDL, LDL, cholesterol, because that tells you nothing at all. There are genetic factors that you need to be looking at as well too. You need to be looking at the size of the particle count, the abundance of it, and that's going to be the greatest indicator of that. And cholesterol, you're 100% correct. Eating cholesterol does not raise your cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, it goes back to the whole lifestyle picture. I eat whole eggs every single day for breakfast. I eat red meat. I eat a lot of foods that have cholesterol in it, but my cholesterol levels are very, very low. Right. So it goes back to, you know, where is your body composition at too? But when we combine things like processed foods with processed sugars and then lots of inflammatory fats, industrial seed oils, vegetable oils, all of those combined in one, those are really the enemies that we need to be aware of. Yeah. It's funny because we had this conversation last night. I had a friend of mine. He's like, you don't cook with oil? And I said, well, could you please? That's a very generalized statement. I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I, I cook with Kerrygold grass-fed butter. I, have, I source my meat from a grass-fed cow that I know how it's raised every single year. That way it's sustainable. I'm not just buying factory-raised junk. Even though I grew up in the farming industry, like I, it wasn't that way as a kid, but I know better now. Um, I, I have coconut oil here. I have animal fats here. Uh, so I do rotate what I cook with. I, even, I go old school now. I went back to good old cast iron skillet all the flavors in there. So it's like, yes, I cook with oil, air quotes, ladies and gentlemen, who are listening to this and not watching on YouTube, is that, okay, coconut oil, medium chain triglyceride can handle a little more heat. Even olive oil, uh, avocado oil, they have a higher uh, heat tolerance. Now, the bad ones, you hinted at just now, vegetable oils, corn oils, they're in the cooking section in the, in the store, but the old, uh, the old entry-level dietetics of, oh, stay to the perimeter of the store. Yeah, I don't go down that aisle. <laughs> like, I order my olive oil straight from Italy. I don't, I don't mess around. <laughs> so uh, I, I would think it's important to help people understand that because what you just hint at again is that these are inflammatory things, uh, the stress levels. You're putting stress in the body. The body was never designed to process like highly overly manufactured seed oils and all these bad things. So Yes. It's, 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 I love the fact you also said earlier, I use this term all the time and you, we are from the whatever, same world, the Band-Aid term. I have been saying that the whole drug world is just a pharmaceutical Band-Aid for going on a couple of years now because I get it. Med medicine's important. I'm not taking that away. We may need it short term, but over the long term, this is why I respect people like you is that, okay, but what does it tell you? You, you haven't actually, air quotes again, cured anything because you don't know what brought that symptom on you're just slapping a drug on it which is kind of like this part of the term putting icing on the cake and you're not actually <laughs> learning anything from it yeah so does that drive you nuts oh 100 i agree with you there's a time and a place for med medications you know and it it does wonders for a lot of people but sure. should that be the very first answer for everybody for every case scenario no definitely not um, and going back to what got me into functional medicine, I actually had a whole bunch of health issues myself. So when I got into competing um, and pushing my body to the extremes and going through all of that, I actually began to come down with some of my own health issues. And really? I came down with some pretty severe gastrointestinal issues. And um, they were <laughs> really bad to the extent where eventually I could not eat anything anymore without being in pain. I would lie on the kitchen floor every night. I'd be crying and I wouldn't know what to eat. Um, I lost a ton of weight. I was already pretty lean and in shape, but I just ended up getting now malnourished and I couldn't keep any weight on me. Um, at the end of every night, I would look bloated and distended like I was like eight months pregnant. And um, I went from gastroenterologist to gastroenterologist. They did everything from MRI to CT scan, endoscopy, colonoscopy, only to slap a label on me of IBS mm. or irritable bowel syndrome. That's so general. So general. An irritable bowel. And I'm like, I can't eat anything without being in pain. Like, I was miserable. My quality of life, I had the worst anxiety. I was becoming depressed because, like, your gut is so important. It does everything from, of course, the digestion of your food, but your immune function, mm -hmm. um, 
helps with your hormone regulation, your detox systems. It helps with your brain function, so your mood, your energy. So it does, it's so important. And honestly, I'll describe it as like your foundation for your health because if your gut's not in balance, that's going to affect just everything. So oh, your, your brain completely becomes unbalanced if your gut's unbalanced. They've, they've proven that now that you have a direct tie to brain health and gut health. And, and they're still digging deeper, which is exciting. Like we're still hacking this and learning even more deep and deeper about uh, the gut health, you know, the, the GI health. But this is awesome. I love your gigging in this. So this is good. Keep going. Yeah. Well, yeah, most of your serotonin is even made in your gut. So SSRIs, like that doctors give people, selective serotonin or take inhibitors, those all help with um, keeping serotonin in the gut, which is where it's mainly produced. But going back, so I was just slapped with irritable bowel syndrome. And they're like, oh, you know, take some probiotics, you know, and uh, maybe here's some laxatives, you know, things like that. And I'm like, there is something severe going on here, like terribly going on here. Mm -hmm. I finally mm -hmm. ended up being sent to a colorectal surgeon. So a surgeon now. And now this surgeon is telling me the only solution to my gut issues was to remove my entire large intestine. They love to slice and dice, you know. It's like stomach surgery. I don't believe in that either. My like, guys, you actually didn't learn anything. And now all these people who get the, the stapled stomachs and everything else, years later, they might have great success initially, but then because you didn't fix anything, they're now coming back and having all the weight gain and having something right back on because they haven't actually found the root cause. Like you're, you're doing a That's surgical cool. band-aid now. <laughs> yeah. So I was at the colorectal surgeon and like, I reached a very, very dark point in my life where I was like, I, as a nutritionist, I felt like betrayed because I was like, I've been healthy for my whole life. Like this is like, like working out, eating healthy, like helping other people do the same. I was like, why is this happening to me? I just, I just didn't understand it. So here I was at the, with my boyfriend at the time and my mom at the colorectal surgeon office. And I was just like, I was honestly like scheduling the surgery. I was wow. like, just. I want to be done. I want to go on with my life. But something just like came over me in that moment. And I was like, there's got to be something more to it than this. I'm like, I'm not ready to give up. I, I just don't feel like this is the answer. So needless to say, I decided I would give myself six months and I was going to do everything that I could to try to get to the bottom of this myself. And I realized a lot of the doctors weren't kind of helped me honestly they didn't well, find fair, they didn't know they don't understand they didn't yeah they didn't know no you're correct they didn't know they did the typical tests like they were taught to do in school and all of that but it kind of came back to me so I needed to kind of try to dig down into my lifestyle and really look at the bigger picture so I ended up even going to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic did some different tests things like that and um I didn't really get a concrete answer, but they did confirm that if I were to have removed my entire large intestine, that that would have been the worst thing I could have mm -hmm. ever done for my health. And they said it's a very old procedure that they do. And typically, like our bodies are really smart and our small intestine will actually begin to kind of form and begin to act like a large intestine. Well, because the then, human body was designed a certain way for a reason, right? I mean, you don't, I'm not going to go religious on this or anything, but whatever created mankind, we exist functionally in a certain way for a reason. Like everything works with everything else. <laughs> you take it out and it's like you just broke the, the perfect machine. That's how I look at it. So. Yeah, so that put that to bed, that put that idea to rest at least. So I went home and this is when I really began to study hard. If you've ever gone through something like in your life or had a family member go through something and you just become hyper-focused on this, I mean, you just become an expert in that field. So that's essentially what I did. I became an expert in gut health and I just studied, I read every book, I learned everything that I could about the gut microbiome and digestion, um, SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And I made a lot of different changes with my diet from what I thought was actually a pretty healthy diet. Um, but I had to make changes from more like an anti-inflammatory standpoint, from an easy digestible standpoint. Um, I had to remove a lot. I had to work on my lifestyle too. So things like stress reduction, mental health as well too. So looking back, I think I put like a lot of physical pressure on my 
on my body to look a certain way, to be a certain way. It's a lot of things, even going back to my identity. So it was a lot of different things. And to this day, I can't really say exactly what one thing worked to fix everything. But over the course of weeks, working on this and studying and implementing different changes, I would have fewer bad days. Mm-hmm. And then as months went by, you know, I'll go a month with no issues. And then eventually, like, they were just gone. And, like, my body did heal itself. And that's what really got me more into the functional side of things. I decided to become certified in functional medicine as an addition to my degree in nutrition and dietetics. And that's when I decided to open my own practice in which helping other people get to their root cause of, like, hormonal issues, gut issues and really look at the whole lifestyle approach. So that, so I was going to dig onto that one. So, cause I love that entrepreneurial story slipping in there. So was that the driving factor? Like you, you I, I love the whole geek out diving deep. I mean, yeah. because that's when, you know, it's like, okay, there's something here. Mm-hmm. And if I'm this passionate about something and that's all I can think about, I got to go for it. I got to figure it out. And then as far as like getting into the business piece, of it, was that just because like, tell us, I mean, if we, was it because you were so frustrated with yourself, you wanted to find other people that had going through the same problems or, or like, what was your targeting reason to finally help you realize like, you know what, I need to open a business. Well, so I already was doing nutrition coaching, but I would say like going back to what I was raised, it was more on the athletic side. I mm-hmm. was helping people with weight loss. I was helping them with building muscle, athletic performance. So I was already doing that. I've always enjoyed working with people and helping other people but there's something just different about helping other people like improve their quality of life. Like go from like, for example, me where like I'm miserable, I can't eat anything and to be able to like eat something without like feeling miserable after it. Like that just feels awesome to be able to help people to that extent. So like, I love helping people get six pack abs and all of that, if that's what they want to do, but just to truly be able to improve people's quality of life, it just was a whole nother level for me. You know, I, I love that because I, that's why I am in the health side of things. Cause I have two, I have two brains. I'm the health and fitness junkie, but then I'm, I'm the business guy. I love to help people grow their brands online and everything else. That's my sales and marketing brain. So I too, I do tell people all the time you can exist in multiple domains once you're ready. Like once you've mastered a domain, then add in the other domain. And I love where you're going with this because quality of life is important. And I, I want to hear how you respond to this, but I love people now who, who don't understand why I'm so obsessed and why I share what I share. And I know you would respect what I share when I share my giant, you know, six egg omelet one day. Uh, I don't do that every single day, ladies and gentlemen, that's just a, a training piece. Uh, and they ask their whole eggs and people are like, you sit down and eat a half a dozen eggs and you look like you do. I'm like, well, yeah, because I eat eggs and steak and I don't eat any sugar and I don't eat any bread and, and people are like, well, that sounds like such a boring lifestyle. And I'm like, boring lifestyle? Hold on. Wait a minute. So when I'm grilling fresh grass-fed filet mignon and cooking uh, a locally sourced bacon and, and farm-raised eggs that are yolked, the yolks are glowing dark orange. That's how you know. I mean, I get excited by this, right? And I'm like, what? I was like, oh, okay, so, so hold on. Let's put that one aside. Then they're like, well, you don't eat bread? You don't eat sweets? Like, you don't live a little? And I'm like, live a little? Dude, I'm a crossfitter. I'm a road cyclist. I'm a mountain biker. I'm booking my uh, another skydive coming up here in a few weeks. Like I live life to the fullest. Yes. Okay, so yeah, if I'm gonna go eat a loaf of bread, I'm not gonna be able to perform at my peak level. And my body is so clean; it's talking to me. It's telling me that. So that's why I don't do it because the few times I do throw it back in, I feel like shit. Let's be real. So I don't know. I mean, Rachel, am I crazy? <laughs> No, 100%. I agree with you. I'm the exact same way. Um, I'm probably not like ketogenic, I would say. No, Uh, it's not for everybody. No, it's not for everybody. But uh, I'm I'm more whole foods. Just eat real food. That's really all it comes down to. You don't have to be keto. You don't have to be paleo. But just eat real food. I mean, all this man-made food, processed food, industrial seed oils, bread, you know, this has only just came about here in the last, I don't know, however many years Mm -hmm. and then causing a lot of these health issues. Like I don't eat bread and I don't miss it. I don't eat sweets. I mean, if I want craving something sweet, I'll eat a little bit of fruit, you know, things along those lines. I'll have a little red wine. You know, my, 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 my wife loves wine. 
so more than I do. <laughs> so I was like, you know, yeah, I'll have some red wine, you know, but I don't, I'm not drinking every single day. You know, I'm not, I'm not a binger. I binge on my fitness. So there you go. I, I do binge on the fitness. <laughs> what I like to describe it with my clients is the main problem with the sad diet is hyper palatable foods. Mm-hmm. So foods that taste so good that you just can't stop eating them. So chips, ice cream, crackers, all those type of foods. Um, for example, going back to your steak, we all like steak. We enjoy steak. Um, you'll eat that steak, but you'll stop eating it when you feel full. You're not going to keep eating it. Well, like let's try some- that back. You, you talked about hormones earlier, right? So I'm just going to throw two words, leptin and ghrelin, yeah. right? Those are, so help, help. Do you, do you dig into that with people? Do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Your body's society cues. There you go. So I, I sometimes are nicknamed the hunger hormones, but I was like, yeah, in the, the carb world, one of those stays lit up all the time. And one of the ones never kicks in when the steak world or eggs or bacon world, boom, you hit satiation. Like it's hard to overeat on steak. And I'm, cause my body realized, wait a minute, I got all the nutrition I need. Good. Good. Let's back it down. You know? So yeah, people don't get that. It means, and that's power of hormones. I want to tie that back to what you said earlier, because I love the fact you hit on that because hormonal alignment in the body is so crucial. And the average person on a sad diet, their hormones are all over the place. It's crazy. Yeah, blood sugar levels all over the place. That's why they're getting hangry. They're getting shaky. They're getting all these cravings. So I tend to do people with a little bit more fats, a lot of good protein sources. And then carbohydrates just dependent on each person mm-hmm. is, more of the approach I take, but the food industry is just so good too at creating these foods that you just can't stop eating. So Lay's, I was it Lay's or Pringles? Well, I bet you just can't eat one, and they're right because you just That's can't just stop yeah. eating. They combine foods in a way: salty, sweet, savory, where they just taste so good you just honestly can't stop eating it. And uh, your body gets very used to it. Your taste buds change. So if you've been eating, you know, pizza and chips and ice cream, and then you eat something that is more whole food based, you're going to be like, "Mm, this tastes weird. It doesn't really taste good. But your food should taste good. Don't get me wrong. Like steak tastes good. I grill a lot of different vegetables. Those taste great. Eggs, we enjoy those foods. But we don't need our food to taste so good that we just can't stop eating it. Right. Yeah, because that, that's, and I've got, I'm glad you brought that up again too, because again, these are, the key word there is manufactured, right? So in mother nature, things occur seasonally in a whole form. For examples, strawberries are not a year round product. So eating strawberries year round, very high glycemic fruit, strawberries and bananas. But technically, if you went far enough back before modern farming and greenhouses and everything else we do now, and, and our logistical ability to ship stuff across an entire continent here in the USA, you normally wouldn't have access to that stuff. So yeah, eating it a couple times a year, not that big a deal. You're eating strawberries and bananas every single day in a fruit smoothie, you're basically chugging a sugar bomb. So <laughs> I love to bring that one up because people are like, oh my God, but they taste so good. I'm like, oh, yes, there you go, right? What is the glycemic index? There's a sugar factor there. Now take, that, take what the food companies learn from that and then they're like, wait a minute, let's hire some scientists and biologists, stick them in a lab and make some addicting food. Because that will, that will in turn give us return sales. It all comes back to capitalism, people. We talk about business on this show. I'm, not, I'm, not ra- I'm actually not ragging on it. I mean, they're smart. They know what they're doing. I mean, like McDonald's. Are you kidding me? That is Burger King, McDonald's, any of them. That is the lowest quality of food that you can find out there in the fast food market. But they figured out that, okay, with this special sauce and this crappy burger and this crappy bread and this cheese, once I put it all together it tastes good. If you try to each, each, eat each one of those items separately, there's no way your palate could stand how crappy that would taste. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, but again, they figured out the perfect alignment to hit all the taste buds, hit all that addicting uh, component there to trigger the brain and be like, yes, I need another Big Mac or whatever the other ones are called. <laughs> yeah. And it even goes back to like, if you can think of like, making or not even making (laughs) raising cows and beef so we now feed them grains like we're talking about Mm grass-fed and that's really what cow's diet was intended to be was to be grass-fed and there's nothing wrong with beef but yes when we 
change their diet from what it was intended to be and we start feeding a bunch of grains, grains are a lot more inflammatory to the body. So what is their goal? They want to fatten up these cows as fast as possible so they can slaughter them, so they can make meat, so they can make more money. And that's the whole process. So when they feed them grains, they can make more meat. But it well, should- actually, I'm going to help you out with this. Yeah. Because I went to a, my first slaughterhouse when I was 10 years old. Because that's my dad did. He was a cattle broker. And he was a, he was a shipper. He would help the farms get their animals when they were ready to get rid of them. Okay, well, they're either going to be sold at market. Or if there was a higher dollar value, they would go to slaughter to for meat. You know, for to meet the demand. So when you go to slaughter, you're paid by the pound. So to your point being fattening up, it's not all necessarily good meat, right? You could have excess fat, but the animal has a higher dress weight on the scale. So if there's a price per pound and the animal's heavier, and that doesn't, it's not, doesn't mean it's all usable meat. So that's the problem you're talking about here is that, you know, cows are going to spawn like a human being too. I mean, they're going to, they're going to pack on excess weight with all those inflammatory foods. Are getting. I mean, there's actually a farm I read that they're feeding them Skittles out in California, a factory farm. Yeah. Like there was some bad candy, like it hit the expiration date. So they're like, oh, well, let's just feed them to the pigs and the cows. So they, there was like literally candy companies just shipping this like, like feed to the animals because they know that they can digest them. And I'm like, well, they can sort of digest them. That doesn't mean you give a cow like Skittles. <laughs> crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. But again, like, to your point, right? Whether it's a human being or an animal, you know, listen, I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. People choose their path, whatever. My whole point is I know where my cow was raised. I put a deposit down a year ahead of time. I said, listen, you can raise me a cow. I want to make sure it's all grass fed. And that's all this guy does. The guy only raises what people pay for. So he's not some kind of crazy factory farmer. He's not feeding them full of grains. He's letting them graze in a the pasture. They have, they have really good life, by the way. Uh, so I actually sometimes a little jealous. I want to go just hang out in a pasture all day. <laughs> but to your point, right? Like that's what they want. That's the way they were. The biologically, they were a grazing animal. They were, ne- they were never meant to be in a, in a locked up stanchion being just pumped full of molasses and grain concoctions that mm-hmm. we've created. So yeah, then we think like it, it doesn't have any effect on us, but it definitely does. So a cow that's fed grains is going to have much higher rates of, or much higher omega sixes compared to omega threes versus a cow that's fed grass. Well, yes, it'll still have some omega sixes, but it's not going to have nearly the extent of a grain fed cow. So omega sixes for people who don't know are pro-inflammatory essential fatty acids and omega threes are anti-inflammatory. So we do need both in the body. But with typical standard American diet, we tend to get way more of the omega-6s, pro-inflammatory, and not enough of the omega-3s, anti-inflammatory. So we have a lot of people suffering with, again, chronic inflammation, cholesterol issues, going back to a lot of those health issues. And not saying that everybody needs to go like outsource their cow and, you know, do it, go to that extent, but they do need to pay attention like, where is your food coming from? Like read the food labels. It blows my mind where people will just like pick up foods and like not even look at what's in the food that they're eating. Oh, like, that's, just- that's a great point. I mean, I, yeah, and I agree with you. I just started doing that like a couple years ago again, because that's the way I was raised. And I'm, I'm just been going back. Not everybody can source a cow or have a freezer to store it all. Let's be real. Uh, there's people who might be hearing this show and who might be living in these food desert areas and they don't have accessible to, like I'm an, I'm an hour and a, I'm an hour and a half from New York City and an hour from Philadelphia. I have no problem getting anything. Like my area, Allentown, Pennsylvania, this, a study just came out. We have, within eight hours, companies here can reach 33% of the country's population. So we are, we are a hub for logistics and shipping. So yeah, I don't have a problem getting anything. <laughs> so that's an unfair advantage to some people. So I, I think it's important to bring that up, you're bringing up is that guys, like it's not just, okay, maybe you don't have everything that I can get access to, but can you at least read a label? Pause. Like, do you know what corn syrups are? They don't belong in your jar of pickles. I'm not kidding you. I'm, I'm calling them out because I loved them for years. Clausen's man, what'd you guys do? All right, seriously, I used to love your crunchy pickles. I love a good kosher dill. And then I, I read the label two months ago and there was corn syrup in the ingredients fine print. I'm like, ah. why? Why? It's a pickle. It's a pickle. It's a cucumber. You stick some vinegar and some salt in there. Come on, Rachel. Get upset with me. It's a pickle. That too. (laughs) Right? Read read the fine print. (laughs) Yeah. And we just need to be more, really just more consciously aware and be reading the ingredients. Like 
um, all the food, like cereals, all of that, they're always trying to advertise to you to how healthy they are. Like, for example, I'm high in fiber, I'm low fat, I'm low sugar. You know, they're trying to convince you that they're healthy, that they're good for you. But if you go down the normal produce aisle, you don't see vegetables or fruit or any of those things saying like, I have a lot of fiber. I have a lot of these things because we know they're good for you. We don't need to try to advertise you and convince you that they're healthy. And yeah, you don't have to read a long list of ingredients either and try to determine if it's healthy or not if you're just buying real food. Yeah, you might just have the organic thing now, right? That's actually become a marketing tool. Um, mm -hmm. To be fair, I have some very well-known people that have had on the show and they said, listen, if you don't have organic, who cares? It's still a whole food, okay? Wash it. <laughs> I mean, granted, I mean, if you're a crazy nutball and you're really deep, deep, deep and you, you found there is some concerns obviously around chemicals and things like that, I do agree with that. There is valid studies behind this. But again, sometimes you got to work with what you got. And yeah. people hearing this might be in the middle of, I don't even know where, and they don't have access to everything. They don't, they've never even seen an organic badge. Or the internet <laughs> yeah. to be listening. <laughs> exactly, right? So all of a sudden, that's become a marketing tool. Like, oh, it's, it's, it's organic. Well, what does that mean? Actually, that's just a stamp of approval from a government agency that you paid for. Now, yes, you had to meet some bare minimums, but nowadays, you can actually buy organic chemicals. So you're still spraying chemicals on the food you're growing, but it's okay. It's an organic chemical. So it's yeah. like- guys, like they'll find a way around all this stuff. <laughs> I love your point. Just go whole, start, start with the basics. Yeah. I was just going to say organic just means without herbicides and pesticides. And it has nothing to do with it's healthy. You can find organic cereal, which is very yeah. processed or just using something that hasn't used herbicides and pesticides. And a way to kind of look at what you should buy that should be organic or not. Have you ever heard of a dirty dozen or clean 15 before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great tool. So you don't have to buy everything organic. Um, but Help people look, understand that real quick. What, what, you know, differentiate those two for them. Yeah, so the dirty dozen are a dozen different fruits and vegetables that you should always buy organic because of the herbicides and the pesticides do seep into a lot of these foods. And even if you do wash them, they really don't come very clean. So on the dirty dozen are things like apples, their berries, their lettuce, their spinach, so those are ones you, if you can afford, I would recommend buying organic. On the Clean 15, you can just save your money and buy conventional. So on that list would be like avocados, bananas. Um, I think even like asparagus are on those lists too. I don't have both lists memorized, but they're just, you can look up EW's, um, Dirty Dozen, Clean 15, and kind of just differentiate which you should buy organic and then what because you can just save your money and buy conventional. Well, and those few that you just mentioned, I think also is because of their thicker skin. Like avocados got a thick skin, bananas have a thick skin, even, even asparagus, obviously until you cook it, even that has a nice uh, a thick skin to it. So I think that helps them be a little more resilient. So yeah. I'm making sure we note that here for my VA. So we make sure they get their notes because that's important. So mm -hmm. clean 15, 30 dozen. So, so what's next for you? I mean, we're coming toward the end of the show here. I mean, you're, you're out there, you're trying to increase your public speaking. You obviously have an, a really, almost, would you consider it a second phase of your practice, obviously, when you pair up with that other doctor? Yes. So I have my online brand where I do some online coaching. I have about a quarter of a million following on Instagram right now. So continuing to grow that. That's where I do a lot of the fitness modeling as well, too. Oh, you're going to pull that up? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I got, here's your services, right? Nutritional oh. consulting. Wellness testing, body composition scanning, online coaching. There's the guides. And yes, I already have that up. Ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen, she's got a strong, strong following on Instagram, 266,000. So clearly people like your fitness modeling photos. Yeah. <laughs> so currently doing that, um, trying to get more into public speaking. I really enjoy sharing my story and being able to just impact a larger audience. But at the end of the year, I'll be opening actually a concierge practice, teaming up with two different physicians, oh, cardiologists. Yeah, Andy. yeah, Andy Frizzella. I'm with First Form. I was just listening to his podcast today. I love Andy. Oh, his podcast is great. Yeah, I love him because he says it how it is. He's like me, man. Just That's keep it real. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be opposed to f bombs being dropped. <laughs> no, no. You better be open to profanity with Andy Frizzella, man. He, I mean, he is the. I mean, again, his show is MF CEO. He is the, you know, the motherfucking CEO. I mean, that's him. It's Andy. So, um, but you know, be real. So, yeah. 
that's what he is. He's just real. <laughs> I love his podcast. But yeah, and um, opening that concierge practice. So at the end of this year, it's going to be like a one-stop shop. So going back to functional medicine, nutrition, we just want to be able to get everyone on like a very customized approach. So all of their healthcare needs in one place. So imagine if your nutritionist was in coordination with your doctor, who was in coordination with your trainer, and we were all on the same page trying to find the best approach for you. So that's essentially what we're going to be creating. It's going to be a one-stop shop, membership-based approach, extensive lab testing, genetics. Um, you'll have the nutrition department, which will do customized nutrition. And then we'll have a fitness department, which will do customized fitness programming. Then we'll even have an aesthetic department, which of course we all want to look good to, confidence, doing things like um, facial procedures, lasers, all of that. Okay. Well, I like that back to be have to go still tie this back to the importance of functional medicine. So I love the fact that you're woven that back in. Uh, it's interesting because even a good buddy of mine, uh, a shout out to Rob Eschbach of F13 Performance, because he used to be up until last month for five years, he ran one of my favorite CrossFit gyms here locally called SYR CrossFit. And then he decided, listen, I'm paying all this licensing for the word CrossFit. But his training, everything came from him and his coaches, and he has one of the most successful gyms within like an hour and a half, two hours of here. So he said, yeah, I'm done. So now it's just called F13 Performance because he has, he had, like you guys, it's functional. It's functional fitness. You, CrossFit's just a branding. So he, I, I was very impressed with him stepping out like that, but he made sure he held on to the importance of functional movement, functional uh, health, you know, it's basically across the board from a fitness perspective and otherwise, he's definitely digging a lot more deeper into like you're doing, right? Like the, the help, he obviously not at the medical level like you guys are doing, but at least from the coaching standpoint, the importance of focusing on people's lifestyle choices, like he puts them through now, if you want to work with him one-on-one, you get like an hour, hour and a half long meeting, like That's deep diving. Deep diving and people like, he's like, guess what? He's like, when you sit down, he's like, you're not going to be comfortable. You're, we're going to get deep and you're going to get real. And he's like, he's like, you might even shed a tear, but he's like, I'm here to help you. And I think that's important nowadays. People in the traditional, I hate to use that word traditional, um, in the modern medical world right now, you're lucky if you get 10 minutes with a doctor, right? It's mm -hmm. become an assembly line. So somebody like you and, and your future phase of your practice, I'm excited because people should understand that. It should be more than 10 minutes. You can't learn squat in 10 minutes. <laughs> you need to have a proper one-on-one -on -one time, really build that communication, build the relationship. That's the thing that's nowadays is missing. The relationship. How are you supposed to find out what's going on? Yeah. And what are the barriers too? Like I can hand someone over the perfect nutrition plan and be like, if you follow this, you will get great results. You'll be fit. You'll feel great. But there's oftentimes a lot more barriers than that. And a lot of it goes back to mindset, motivation, you know, lack of confidence. Why can't we follow it? It's not just easy as black and white as here's the, here's the medication. Here's the perfect nutrition plan. There's a lot of other things that come to play as well too. So I actually end up doing probably a lot more mindset counseling as well too, in addition to the nutrition side of things. I do like that. We geek a lot out on the mindset side here. Uh, cause I tell people all the time, you know, it's health, it's business it's lifestyle, but it's fitness. But over three years of podcasting, the power of mindset comes up all the time. And we literally have every month I bring on a regular sports psychologist just so she can talk about uh, different phases and angles around the mindset component because the world's top athletes, Olympians, everybody now focuses so much more on, on mindset than they've ever done before. So the health of the mind is crucial a, a part of this functional medicine package. Oh, for sure. Um, stress, you know, the mental side of things, that can have tremendous effects. I mean, going back to my own health issues, I truly believe a lot of that came down to the stress and all of that that I was putting on my body. And I had to not best approach the nutrition and the digestion aspect of it too, but I had to look at the whole picture. Yeah. Well, and also, ladies and gentlemen, when you do go visit her website, which again is her name, rachelshear.com, uh, make sure you click on the YouTube channel uh, because I think what two months ago you had just posted your speaking engagement, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, so here we go, a little screen share. There you are on stage. So you were at a million dollar mastermind event. So, yes, sir. and you shared some of that story obviously today, yes. but obviously, I'm guessing this video dives a lot deeper. Correct. Okay, so there you go. We'll make sure we get that linked in the show notes as well. So, my VA listens to the show. So, there you go. There's your tag. Link the YouTube. <laughs> well, listen, Rachel, I've had a blast today. Have you? 
All right. Well, I, I have a question for you. I have, I have all my guest co-hosts help close the show out. It's not that big okay. a deal. But for somebody who's standing for the level of health and fitness you do, I know you don't have a problem with this question, but I ask my guest co-hosts, since you know, it's your show too, how would you want to close the show out? This is an opportunity to kind of share some all-encompassing words or an all-encompassing message behind everything you're doing. But that way, if they forget everything else you shared today, like, hey, you know what? This is Rachel. You know, this is what I want to leave you with. Yeah, I would say kind of going back to a lot of the things we've talked about is just your health, honestly, it is wealth. Your health is the foundation for everything and not just the way you look and um, it, it affects everything. It affects your business. It's going to affect your relationships with your family. It's going to affect your, your confidence. If you want to reach new levels of success and you want to really be at the top of your game with your business, with your life, we need to be looking at the foundation. We need to be looking at our diet, our exercise, our hydration levels, and that's going to transpose to all areas of your life. So I would encourage people to just start with the basics looking at their lifestyle and building that up and going from there. So building the self-discipline and also just knowing you're enough and knowing you're worth it too. Because I think a lot of people struggle with self-doubt, low confidence and building up like what Andy Frizzella even talks about a lot in his podcast that are, you know, when you do the difficult things, the things you don't want to do, you do the things you say you're going to do not only is it going to help you achieve your goals, but you're going to build up a reputation with yourself and you're going to be able to achieve the things that you want to and build up that confidence. So I love that. And yeah, Andy's a wildcat, but yeah. <laughs> well, listen, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the year. Amazing words. Uh, I think the biggest piece I'll take out of that, all that will be quoted in her blog article for the, for this episode, ladies and gentlemen, so you don't miss anything, but the one thing I loved out of that was, you know, you are worth it. You know, put yourself first, put yourself first and put the work into it because uh, nothing worth achieving in life didn't come with a whole lot of work. So let's be real. She's amazing. She's got a lot of great services, but it's going to take some work. You got to take some accountability to make sure that you're worth it. So thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen, to another powerful Live the Fuel episode. Again, we're here to fuel your health, business, and your lifestyle. Make sure you check her out at rachelshear.com. She definitely heavily fueled our healthy lifestyles today. And remember, you too can live the fuel. And we'll talk to you guys again soon.